Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the third session of our workshop, Wittgenstein's Philosophy in Time of Crisis. Our session today will last uh, two hours in total. And we will uh, first hear a talk that will take about, last about uh, 45 minutes, after which we will hear a response. And after this, we will uh, open up the general discussion. Um, during the discussion, you can uh, pose your questions by writing them down on the chat. So please use the chat in order to uh, ask your questions. They will be then repeated by the host, uh, which is myself. I'm Dan Karadjenovic and I will moderate today's, uh, today's session. Um, I would also like to uh, tell you a few words about this workshop. Uh, it is uh, meant to bring together Wittgenstein researchers from all over the world to reflect, reflect on the current situation through the lens of Wittgenstein's philosophy, so to say. And it is organized by an international team of researchers from Japan, China and uh, Germany. So I'd like to use the chance to also introduce to you my uh, co-organizers and co-hosts today. Uh, Wei uh, from Nagoya, uh, yes, uh, David from Airfoot and uh, Hai Chang uh, from Beijing and also a member of our team is also Saori from Shiba who is unfortunately not able to participate today but she will be giving a talk on the 3rd of July and I will say more about this towards the end of the session. Okay, uh, so um, now I am very happy to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Alfred Nordmann from the Technical University of Darmstadt. Uh, Professor Nordmann works primarily in the field of philosophy of science and philosophy of technology, and he has a broad range of publications on these topics. But I will today now focus on his work on Wittgenstein uh, and his ongoing interest in Wittgenstein and mention only a few publications of his uh, on Wittgenstein. Uh, first of all, there is the uh, introduction to Tractatus that has been published in the year 2005 by the Cambridge University Press. Then uh, there are two edited volumes he edited together with James Klage. Uh, philosophical occasions and public and private occasions. And uh, also his latest publication of Wittgenstein is actually an interesting, uh, um, it's, it's an article uh, published in the journal Techne and is, it is exploring connection with connections between philosophy of technology and Wittgenstein's philosophy and carries the title, A Feeling for the Work as a Limited Whole, Wittgenstein on the Problems of Philosophy and the Problem of Technology. And I would also like to point out that uh, actually the, um, Professor Nordman's interest in philosophy of science and philosophy of technology is connected with his interest in Wittgenstein in many ways, since he also explored the influence of the German physicists Heinrich Hertz and Georg Christoph Lichtenberg on Wittgenstein. Um, after Professor Nordman's talk, we will hear a response uh, by Alexander Berg uh, from uh, the University of Zurich, currently the University of Zurich. Alexander Berg has also worked um, a lot on uh, Wittgenstein and especially classical uh, German idealism, focusing on relation between Wittgenstein and Hegel. He has also uh, organized two international conferences, at least two conferences, uh, exploring connections between Wittgenstein and Hegel. And his doctoral dis dissertation carries the title Absolute Knowledge and Groundless Certainty, uh, Hegel and Wittgenstein. So I, I allowed myself to translate it from German. I hope this is, uh, this is good enough. Um, okay, so um, and now I... Um, I uh, would like to uh, thank Professor Nordman uh, for accepting our invitation to give a talk in our uh, workshop. And the talk here is the title, uh, Philosophy in Captivity, which is, I think, the topic we are now all too familiar with. And it connects nicely to a previous talk given by Hans Luga that carried the title, uh, Wittgenstein as a Liberatory Thinker. So I'm very excited to hear uh, uh, Professor Nordman's talk and uh, I would uh, um, just say we would start now. Let's start. Enjoy the talk. Uh, Professor Nordman, you have the microphone. Well, thank you very, very much for this wonderful introduction, for the invitation. And uh, I very much hope that as we are all learning uh, a new kind of choreography, a new kind of dance, a new form of togetherness uh, in the times of Corona, 
as we are all looking from our prison cells into the world uh, through uh, the lens of uh, our computers. Uh, I do hope that everything works out technically. technically. And uh, I, please do interrupt me if I speak too fast, also for this medium, too fast, uh, or uh, if there are other problems uh, which I should take into consideration. So, um, so we are talking about Wittgenstein's philosophy in times of crisis. And and you might say, and this may well be one of the motivating factors of this, uh, of this conference, uh, of this series of lectures, you may say that, of course, Wittgenstein's philosophy owes to times of crisis. It originated in times of crisis. It was a perpetual, perpetually uh, uh, inhabiting uh, a time of crisis. Uh, of course, most pointedly, perhaps when we imagine the Tractatus being written in the trenches of uh, World War I, um, or at least uh, in the conditions, under the conditions of World War I. And yet, of course, interestingly, maybe uh, uh, provocatively, uh, maybe disturbingly, we actually have to dig deep in Wittgenstein's notebooks and diaries to find references to these times of crisis, to find references to matters of history and politics. So his philosophy somehow s seems strangely purified uh, and, uh, and uh, strangely free of these kinds of references to very particular conditions of life. And uh, yet, however, we want to do this today, right? This is our challenge today, that even though we have in front of us a philosophy that does not carry the signature of the times of crisis in which it was created, we still want to uh, consider his philosophy and what it says to us today. So crudely speaking, what, if anything, does Wittgenstein have to say to a world that is gripped by the corona pandemic? Okay, and I want to take up this challenge, but I find that there is no direct way to proceed. And that's why I want to begin, in some sense, you might say, with the pandemic itself. Because uh, what the pandemic does, uh, which is interesting, especially to philosophers of technology, is it is uh, like a tool. It's a, it's, it, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it is a probe. It exposes uh, facts about our lives. It exposes, uh, as we look at our different societies, the weaknesses and strength, the, cap the capabilities and the failures of our societies. The weak spots become uh, highlighted and illuminated through the, the virus. Uh, in this sense, the corona pandemic is, you might call it like a stress test. Uh, it puts us under pressure such that we have to prove ourselves and reveal who we are. This also holds in a sort of roundabout way for Wittgenstein's philosophy. Uh, if we start considering the corona pandemic uh, and uh, how it affects us, uh, this is actually a way of probing and exposing perhaps some of Wittgenstein's intuitions. And that's the route that I want to take. So that's why I want to begin with the pandemic itself and see what it illuminates, what it exposes uh, about Wittgenstein's thinking. Uh, in particular, I want to say it shows that Wittgenstein is a thinker of captivity, entrapment, imprisonment. Uh, this does not contradict uh, Hans Sluger's comments last, uh, uh, at the last or at one of the last uh, uh, occasions where he spoke of Wittgenstein as a liberatory thinker. Uh, but of course, it depends a lot on what kind of pathos or uh, 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 what kind of association we have with this idea of a liberatory thinker. Um, to put it bluntly, I would argue, and I think Sluga uh, tended that way in his presentation, but uh, readers and discussants will, will have to judge. Uh, to put it bluntly, I would say, according to Wittgenstein, we become liberated when we stop trying to escape from the cage that holds us captive. So liberation is acquiescence. In order to be free, uh, we have to accept our fate and uh, we have to accept how things are, allowing them to be as they are. And we have to accept, of course, very much the limits uh, 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 under which we exist, the walls of uh, the cage, the walls of uh, the cage that we run up against. Uh, 
So in some ways we have to surrender our will and perhaps even surrender our intellect to become truly free, uh, free at least of the pain of trying to escape. Um, so uh, this, of course, is a uh, very kind of bl uh, blunt description. I think, again, Sluga's comments uh, uh, tended in that direction because he was very careful in how he qualified this notion of the liberatory thinker. Uh, it appears to me, even though I haven't checked it out, that the book that he refers to by Rupert Reed uh, uh, would not agree with this account, that Rupert Reed definitely wants to go further and has a more emphatic notion of liberation in the sense of emancipation and so on. I don't have this, I mean, this is liberation without emancipation. This, what I'm talking about, is liberation in terms of acquiescence. Now, I'm not, of course, the first one to argue this. Uh, uh, this has been discussed, uh, especially in relationship to Schopenhauer, and some have argued that this is Schopenhauer's legacy in Wittgenstein's philosophy. And it has uh, been discussed very nicely in a, uh, in a paper by Joachim Schulte uh, under the heading of Wittgenstein's quietism. Um, but uh, for those of us who also enjoy popular culture and uh, how Wittgenstein is presented in popular culture, you may remind, you may recall the movie by Derek Jarman called Wittgenstein with the Derek, uh, with the, uh, with the Terry Eagleton script. And this movie shows him as he seeks a kind of safe haven in the cage of language games and public forms of life, which do not allow for the expression of private matters. So our privacy is in some sense locked up, imprisoned uh, within uh, uh, a kind of culture of uh, public expression. Um, so, uh, and in fact, the movie suggests that if he weren't in that cage, uh, his, what he would call his sinfulness and or homosexuality would expose itself. And that actually, in some sense, Wittgenstein is quite happy to hide in this, uh, you might say, cage, in this uh, cage of conventions uh, and public discourse. But today, again, I want to make a different kind of argument. I don't want to argue from Wittgenstein's sources or from his psychology or from uh, 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 in any way um, his, you might say, his, his philosophical doctrine, if there is such a thing. But I want to, in some sense, start with the pandemic itself. So, uh, and how does one start with it? Well, I mean, obviously, we are being philosophers. We start with a text. And I want to start with the text that uh, many of us have been reading lately, uh, a book that we picked up again. It was written in 1947, namely Albert Camus' novel, The Plague, La Peste. Uh, this is definitely a book from a time of crisis in many ways, in more ways than one, uh, having emerged just recently from uh, uh, the terror of World War II and of uh, Nazi uh, domination of parts of Europe and, and, and a terrible uh, uh, pro persecution. Um, so um, this book by Camus, which is of course a book literally about a plague um, and that I, I imagine many of you know or have read. This is a book which I believe Wittgenstein himself has in most uh, likelihood not read even though it appeared, uh, in, you might say, in time. But, uh, uh, and this book begins with a, um, with a quotation, and not a every edition actually has that. Uh, so I noticed that some of the English editions do not actually include the epitaph of the book. I mean, the kind of opening quotation that Sartre uses. And this is a, a quote, again, it resonates very deeply as a lot of philosophical resonances. Uh, it is a quote from... Daniel Defoe was Robinson Crusoe. I'm told, even though I have not actually been quite able to find the place. So I have to go hunting for the place in which Daniel Defoe actually says this in Robinson Crusoe. And what it says is, uh, and this is something I will read now, it is as reasonable to represent one kind of imprisonment by another as it is to represent anything that really exists by that which exists not. So, all right, so this is, uh, maybe I should read it again, and it's a, uh, and, but I will not go into all the aspects of this quote, okay? So, but let's uh, just 
pick up on that first half of the sentence, which I find important for our discussion here, that it is reasonable to represent one kind of imprisonment by another. Okay, so, uh, so uh, what happens with this Daniel Defoe quotation? It, uh, first of all, establishes a link uh, not only to Robinson Crusoe, who is a kind of uh, interesting case of a solitary, uh, almost solitary man on, a, on an island somewhere, uh, but who is at the same time still part of a public language uh, uh, and culture of England. Um, so, uh, so it's an interesting reference for sure for anyone uh, who is philosophically interested. But uh, in this case, maybe more directly, uh, it is a reference also to Daniel Defoe as another author who's written about the plague. Uh, there is a, a Defoe's book, Journal of the Plague Year, it is called, in which uh, Defoe uses also the metaphor of prison and imprisonment quite a bit. Uh, uh, he, uh, Defoe, writes a lot about how people during the plague live and die imprisoned in their own houses. Um, so literally and metaphorically, uh, this idea of imprisonment, captivity, uh, is, is very prominent also in Camus' novel. But this is not a literary uh, discussion. Uh, I'm not a literary scholar. So I will not now try to trace those metaphors of Camus. But what I want to do instead is go straight to the uh, a central passage in Camus' book, which has a lot to do with this idea of representing one kind of imprisonment by another. Um, so uh, this is in part four of, uh, of uh, the Camus' novel, where you, we get a kind of uh, explication of this, or, an, or maybe an instantiation or, or exemplification. Um, so what does Camus mean when he speaks that he's representing one kind of imprisonment uh, by another? So it's not just talking about uh, the plague uh, in somewhat close analogy maybe to the terror of, uh, of fascism or the terror of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a world war. Uh, but it's, uh, it is in some sense a, a, a much uh, more existential or existentialist, of course, theme that we find. So uh, in this case, what we find is that the character called Taru um, uh, says that he has been struck by the plague long before the actual plague broke out. So that is his story of the plague, that he says, one reason why I can deal with this plague is because I have been suffering from the plague for a very, very long time. Uh, and so and now we come to that plague, which, re which is represented by the plague that has actually occurred. Um, so, uh, and this is the, the plague that Taru is suffering from for a long time. He is suffering from simply in virtue of being part of what you might say, a culture of death. He is responsible even if unwillingly, and even if only in small part, for death. Uh, uh, death in the name of justice, in fact, as he, uh, as he speaks about someone who received the death penalty, uh, 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 which was uh, issued by his father. Um, so through that, as a child, when his father issued that death penalty, uh, he became part of the culture of death, and this, the plague sort of gripped him. Uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, the, the culture of death in the name of justice, but also, of course, of murder and war. So this Taru is already unfree or imprisoned in virtue of being infested. Uh, so uh, so he, he says uh, at one point, and this is a quote from the novel, all I maintain is that on this earth there are pestilences and there are victims. And it's up to us as far as possible not to join forces with the pestilences. So, uh, but this world is already in some sense shaped, constructed, uh, 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 defined by this opposition, the pestilence, and it, the, and it, it produces, of course, the victims. So, uh, so even if we want to 
to choose as far as possible, as he says very carefully, uh, to not join forces with the pestilence, the terms of the game are already set, right? They are set by the pestilence. Um, so um, he is weak, he says, uh, and uh, in that position of weakness, he has to act. He is, he is weak towards that culture that he, that he wants to defy, that he does not want to join. So he says this act of will that he wants to produce, the act of will of not joining with the pestilences, he says actually is not a form of superiority, but a form of deficiency. Because he somehow can't be a part of that culture of death, he doesn't want to be a part of it, he wants to resist it, but he, this is from the beginning, from a point of view of deficiency. So this is how Tavru talks about it, and I will give you um, a, 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 a very beautiful uh, statement, which I think resonates very clearly with, with our time of crisis today. So he says, what's natural is the microbe. All the rest, health, integrity, purity, if you like, is a product of the human will of a vigilance that must never falter. The good man, the man who, who infects hardly anyone, is the man who has the fewest lapses of attention. And it needs tremendous willpower, a never-ending tension of the mind to avoid such lapses. So this is the condition, in some sense, under which to live in the culture of pestilence, in a culture of death, which is uh, where death is some sense, it comes in naturally with the microbe. It is not something that we can choose. It is not something that is subject of our will. But as we try to not join the force of this culture or of this, uh, uh, of this pestilence, as we try to resist, we have to muster uh, uh, vigilance, attention, care um, every step of the way. So the imprisonment by the plague is to be taken captive by the microbe, by, by the microbe, by what's natural and not subject to our will. Uh, this uh, is uh, an imprisonment also of the good person, right? Who must be attentive, who, who does not, the, who in the best cases, in the best of cases, infects hardly anyone, right? Um, the only escape or release from this constancy of effort is death, he says, and short of that, we can't hope or expect much. We can't have great ambitions. Um, so this is actually another quote from Taru. He says, if I too become a carrier of the plague germ, at least I don't do it willfully. I try in short to be an innocent murderer. You see, I have no great ambitions. Um, So uh, let's see, uh, I will end near here. We don't want to talk about Camus for the whole time. This is a Wittgenstein lecture after all. So I'll just give you two more quotes from Camus' book, uh, where in some sense, they are not connected directly to this passage, but in some sense, he also elaborates this condition, uh, this condition of imprisonment, uh, which he describes also, of course, in other more literal terms. But here, he speaks at a moment, uh, uh, he, he, he speaks about the people in the town where he says, at such moments, the collapse of their courage, willpower, and endurance was so abrupt that they felt they could never drag themselves out of the pit of despondence into which they had fallen. Therefore, they forced themselves never to think about the problematic day of escape they had to force themselves to cease looking to the future and always to keep, so to speak, their eyes fixed on the ground at their feet. So this is again something that we've been discussing uh, philosophically also with, with colleagues here, that there is somehow in this time of pandemic an interesting loss of the future, right? That all our attention, all our care is dedicated to the preservation of a certain culture, of a certain possibility of of living, and uh, and uh, there comes with this sort of loss of the future, which is another form of imprisonment, 
uh, and uh, and uh, it would be very interesting to talk about Wittgenstein as a philosopher strictly of the present, uh, which uh, where where there is very little reference even to the, even the possibility of the future. There's always just a world to which we care, uh, to which we tend, uh, 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 and in which we 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 perform uh, our our lives. Um, but there is, in some sense, no future in Wittgenstein. That's a very interesting point, but let's not go there uh, right now. So, uh, so, but this loss of the future is, I think, part of what uh, what uh, the uh, the the condition of the pandemic, uh, uh, what defines this condition, and um, and here uh, Camus describes it very literally uh, in the sense of uh, people who are not even looking ahead. Right? They're not looking ahead. They're looking, so to speak. Uh, down, eyes fixed on the ground at their feet. They're moving one foot in front of the other, and that is the extent of what they do. Uh, it is in the thick of calamity, he writes, that one gets hardened to the truth. In other words, to silence. Okay, so much about Sartre. Okay, and now, uh, excuse me, not Sartre, Camus. I hope I didn't say uh, Sartre before. I mean, there is an existentialist uh, uh, dimension, of course, here, but we're talking about Camus. All right. So, okay, you might say, now, where is this leading? Okay, where does Wittgenstein come in? And I want to do this in a very abbreviated way. I will now present you a quote from Wittgenstein, which on the first reading has, it seems, very little to do with anything. And then I will try to explore uh, connections and what the pandemic exposes here. So, um, so this passage uh, of Wittgenstein that I want to read to you now also exemplifies that we are captive of our natural history. Now, we don't have to talk about the pestilence or the plague, but the nat our natural history more generally, a natural history which is also a natural history of our form of life. Uh, so. Uh, the natural history, as Wittgenstein uses that term, especially in the so-called second part of the philosophical uh, investigations, is a, is a natural history of our practices, of our conventions, of our form of life. So this, uh, um, this quote that I will give you is uh, taken from the diary uh, Denkbewegungen, or Movements of Thought, and I noticed that Hans Luger was also quoting from it quite a bit, uh, uh, so you have been encountering this text, which is one of those transitional texts. Uh, you might say, especially those of you who think that there is a big difference between the, the early and the late Wittgenstein. Here we look in the year 1931, uh, uh, during his stay in Norway, where uh, Wittgenstein uh, uh, writes down various kinds of notes, and incidentally, actually very close to the passage, which I will read to you now, you will find the, the remark, or you might even say the aphorism, that we are imprisoned in our skin. Uh, but uh, this is, I don't want to go there. I want to go to another quote from uh, the end of January 1931. Okay, so, so what do we see here? He writes, one could conceive a world where the religious people are distinguished from the irreligious ones only in that the former were, work, were walking with their gaze turned upwards while the others looked straight ahead. So a world in which there are some people who are religious, some are not religious, and the only way to distinguish them really is that, or how they distinguish themselves even, is that the non-religious people that look straight ahead and the religious ones all look up. We have this saying in German, Hans Kuck in die Luft, so, um, uh, from Wilhelm Busch. So what I mean is, and I continue now the quote. He says, what I mean is that in this case, religiosity would not seem to be expressed in words at all. And these gestures would still say as much and as little as the words of our religious writings. Okay, so here we have now, after he imagines this world, we have now a, a, a story uh, uh, which expresses 
uh, you might say, a very much a tractarian point. So this is, I would argue, very much indebted to the basic philosophy, the, the basic intuitions of Wittgenstein's Tractatus, which, however, I think uh, continue on through the whole, the, the whole of his philosophy. So, um, so what does he say here? And I'll read it one more time, and then I will try to, uh, to, uh, to elaborate. So I'll read one more time the second part. So in this case, where we have this distinction of, uh, of religious and non-religious people simply in virtue of how they look, so, uh, so in this case, it is the case that religiosity would not be expressed in words at all. And the gestures would still say as much and as little as the words of our religious writings. So, um, so in the Tractatus, as you know, Wittgenstein grappled with what he considered an enormous difficulty of expression. I mean, that's actually one, one, uh, one remark that you find as he writes the Tractatus, that this is what he's working with, an enormous difficulty of expression, asking what can be expressed in speech or in words, uh, 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 finding that only facts can be expressed in speech. That is, we can say only what is and what is not the case in the world. The rest is famously silence as far as speech, as far as language, as far as, uh, as words are concerned. So, um, but where we are silent and do not say or not even try to say what we cannot express in words, um, we can still express things in other ways. I think this is an important part of uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy throughout again. Um, so a gesture, uh, uh, for example, says as much or as little as religious writing does. In fact, a gesture says nothing, right? I mean, I think this is a, a, a very easy to see from the Tractarian point of view. Um, uh, it, uh, um, because it's not in the mode of saying, it's not in the mode of putting forward uh, uh, an opinion, a statement, something that can be deliberated, an opinion, something I think true or false. It doesn't say anything. Whatever a gesture is uh, and whatever it expresses, it's not an act of saying. Uh, so, uh, and of course, this is what, uh, track, what uh, Wittgenstein also wants to say about religious writing. Uh, religious writing fails at saying anything of value or meaning. But it is an effort. The religious writing is an effort. It's we strain. It's an eff effort to express something that cannot be expressed um, uh, uh, in words. It, it, so religious writing itself is performing a gesture of sorts. Uh, the gesture, as Wittgenstein would say, of running up against the limits of language or the walls of our cage, right? And if you remember his lecture on ethics, for example, it concludes just with that, right? That as we that he has a great respect for people who are trying to express something that cannot be expressed. Uh, they, ca they get bruises, as he says later, uh, by running against the walls of their cage. We catch these bruises, and that is in some sense what, uh, what the effort of religious writers is. He says he has great respect for that, but of course it doesn't yield a kind of successful way of saying things. It is a gesture, it's an, it's an effort to, to to, uh, to, uh, to gesture at something beyond the expressible, the sale. So, um, so as a gesture of religiosity then, this attempt to write something in a religious way uh, is perfectly equivalent to that other gesture, the one that he describes in this world, by which believers distinguish themselves from non-believers uh, looking up into the sky. Without seeking to express something in speech, this way of walking does the trick, as does, of course, also kneeling, as he says in a different place, uh, uh, or covering your head, right? So there are all kinds of gestures which express what people might try to express when they write something religiously. <laughs> so um, so um, it doesn't matter what that gesture is, he actually wants to say, as long as it is performed with a kind of earnestness or sincerity, as uh, sort of there's an intention in that gesture. It, it gestures at something, uh, uh, even though that at is not uh, something that is uh, uh, in the realm of facts or in the realm of, uh, of, of the sayable. The priest scribbling away, searching for the right words, the person walking with his gaze turned towards, uh, gazed, uh, with his gaze turned towards the heavens. 
Okay. Um, so now, why did I give you that passage? You might already think this is a very cheap pun, a kind of a, almost like a joke uh, that is here at the heart of my talk. Uh, because I just read to you from Camus, where he says the people in the pestilence uh, imprisoned by that particular uh, 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 moment in natural history where the microbe sort of dominates their lives, uh, these people are, uh, are so imprisoned that they don't have a future. They look down at the earth uh, they, uh, at the bottom of their feet. So these people are sort of turned towards the earth. Now Wittgenstein imagines here people gesturing towards the heavens. Uh, uh, this is, uh, so I want to see what can we sort of understand or learn from this kind of, you might say, analogy. Um, so, um, so let me give you one more quote from uh, the Denkbewegung. Uh, and it uh, helps us in, in some sense elucidate again with Wittgenstein uh, the status of these kinds of gestures, the kind of condition that is expressed uh, through, uh, 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 through, uh, through this uh, and how it is distinct in some ways from saying and trying to express something in words or in language. So, <clears throat> and uh, again, it's a religious point uh, because in these diaries, Wittgenstein is very much concerned with questions of religiosity and intellect and will and so on. So, um, and he, he writes here, the idea, he says, that nowadays someone would convert from Catholicism to Protestantism or from Protestantism to Catholicism is painfully embarrassing to me, as to many others. So what Wittgenstein is saying, it's actually the German word is peinlich. So the idea is peinlich, it's deadly embarrassing, uh, painfully embarrassing, to imagine that someone would want to convert from one religion to another. Um, uh, this, he says, can make sense nowadays only as a tradition that is changed like a conviction. And uh, so a tradition is, uh, I mean, my, my religion, my religion is my tradition, right? If I become someone, if I change my religion, I change my tradition, he says. And I act as if this was like a change of a conviction. Like I have different beliefs, I have different opinions, I hold different things, true or false. So, um, uh, so uh, and this of course for him is a category mistake. You might say something utterly absurd uh, 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 to, uh, to, to treat your own tradition as if it was a, an opinion or conviction. It is if someone wanted to exchange, he says, I, I keep reading here, it is if, it's as if someone wanted to exchange the burial rites of our country for those of another. So, um, uh, so as if we wanted to, so our country has a way of burying the dead and, uh, and we now decide to do it in a different way. Uh, as if we were changing opinions or convictions, right? And, uh, and, uh, and he finds this, uh, uh, as I said, a kind of category mistake, incommensable. In fact, he says, he goes on to say, um, Anyone converting from Protestantism to Catholicism appears like a mental monstrosity, a geistiges monstrum. So this is very strong words, right, that he uses here to say that there is something utterly absurd if we start thinking about uh, choosing a, a, a religion as if we were choosing a kind of truth, a kind of theory, a kind of opinion, a kind of conviction. So... Uh, and of course, central to this is his overarching intuition that you find in many of his, uh, of his discussions, that uh, we can only have convictions uh, where we can be wrong, okay? So the question of opinion, of a statement, uh, uh, of, of a statement uh, uh, that, that claims truth can only be made where it could also be wrong. But we cannot be wrong about a burial rite. We cannot be wrong about the way in which we uh, bury the dead. Uh, 
And therefore, the local practice of how, it, how we do this is not an opinion which we change. Uh, traditions, the natural for history of our form of life, the language we adopt, and our storehouse or our repertoire of gestures are somehow prior to the game of right and wrong, uh, true and false. So, um, so within the imprisoned world of Camus' uh, uh, pestilence, right, where everyone is downtrodden and can only look towards the ground or within a certain world where we distinguish ourselves by the gestures of kneeling and showing piety and humility or the, uh, the gesture of looking ahead and being confident and straight forward and so forth. Within this, we can talk about having opinions, uh, debating questions about right and wrong. But these things, these uh, conditions themselves are just our form of life. And of course, this is finally uh, maybe a reference, now finally a famous quote from Wittgenstein uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, it uh, resonates very much with a very central passage that, that you probably all know from the Philosophical Investigations, remark 241, where he says that it is what humans say that is true and false. So what we say is true and false, uh, 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 but where we don't say anything, there is no true and false. Uh, so, and again, uh, uh, religious practice, religious writings don't in some, in some sense say anything that is true or false. They are gestures, they gesture at something. Uh, so we don't, what we humans say is true and false and they agree in the language they use. And that is not an agreement in opinions, but in form of life. So, okay, so let me actually conclude here by asking a question that you've been all perhaps waiting for. Now, how do I tie this back in together? So we started with Camus' pestilence. We went, then went on to a very, very much more generalized view of Wittgenstein, according to which you might say the form of life, the repertoire of gestures, uh, the language we adopt and that we agree in. Those, this is, you might say, the frame, perhaps the prison in which we uh, operate and which we, in which we can then negotiate, in which we then exercise our will. Um, but uh, so this is what I've shown so far, but where the, now does the corona crisis come in? And uh, so let me just uh, pose a little po problem or puzzle. So um, here in Germany, we have a kind of ritual. It's not just the ritual of burying the dead, but it's the ritual of how we greet each other, right? So a greeting ritual. And that ritual consists in extending your hand and shaking the hand of another person, right? That's another kind of basic ritual of uh, our form of life, of our sociality. In recent months, we changed this ritual under the pressure of the corona crisis. We don't shake hands anymore. Now, that's not allowed, right? Insta instead, we, if we want to do anything at all, we awkwardly sort of brush up with our elbows to one another, <laughs> okay? So our elbows can touch, but not our hands, okay? So this is a very kind of awkward and curious uh, new dance that we perform, you might say, uh, as we meet and encounter, and encounter and recognize each other. Now, of course, we do this based on evidence, on facts, right? And we, we do this for reasons, right? So, um, and so we do this for the reason that we want to in avoid infections, right? So we are told, someone told us, uh, don't shake hands, uh, do this in this other way. Now, this might actually uh, put Wittgenstein's point to a kind of test. Uh, uh, so uh, does that mean that these kinds of rituals, the ritual of shaking hands or of brushing up with your elbows, um, are like opinions or convictions after all, that they express something about, uh, uh, that they say something about perhaps risks of infection and so forth? Well, as you can see already, I doubt this. Uh, so even though you might say here we are changing our way of life, we are changing, we are adopting ch gestures or we are changing something in our repertoire of gestures based on, because we are impressed by the facts, this, what is this fact that is kind of holding us to this? Uh, is this really an agreement, an opinion? Is this really a, 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 a conviction? Uh, I want to suggest that this different way of dancing with one another or this different way of interacting, shaking hands, uh, brushing elbows, uh, is actually a bit like uh, what Wittgenstein was talking about, the world of the religious and the non-religious. 
of looking straight ahead, of looking up into the skies, of being maybe humble uh, and celebratory uh, of a higher being or being sort of confident and straightforward of claiming the world for yourself and how, however you want to put it. There is the world of confidence and then there is a world of fear, you might say, or a world of danger, right? In the world of confidence, we naturally confront each other and reach out to each other. In a world of fear or danger, where we are danger to one another, uh, we avoid each other, right? So what's natural is the microbe, and with it comes the world of fear. It's a, so it's, it's really a, an event in our natural history, which is sort of uh, affecting now the, uh, the, the history of our conventions and, um, and uh, gestures. Uh, it sets the conditions and constraints that demand heightened attention, vigilance, and care. Uh, so we acquiesce to this fact of natural history in death or by adopting this new form of dancing with each other, this new choreo choreo choreography of life. And, we and when we fall into this dance, we are by no means, I think, agreeing in opinion. In fact, there's lots of differences of opinion about how we think about what's happening and uh, or even how we think about the necessity of uh, of, uh, of performing these acts, uh, but, uh, but uh, we adapt in some sense to an altered form of life. Uh, I don't know how lasting it will be, whether we will sort of move on to or return to our old habits at some point, but uh, I would uh, describe this as, uh, uh, as one way of, 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 of looking uh, uh, at a kind of change practice which uh, uh, which uh, sort of grips all of us and uh, which sets new terms of engagement uh, but uh, which is not in the realm of of the sayable uh, but which is a form of expressing who we are through these awkward gestures uh, who we are right now as we lack the confidence uh, of normal of claiming normality all right so i leave it here i hope i didn't talk too long uh, I, I, uh, given that we had some technical issues. Uh, so um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfred Nordman, for your talk containing many references to pest and uh, starting with the pandemic, uh, which was a, a good way to start indeed and for this nice conclusion. Um, I would now like to ask Alexander Berg uh, to give a short response to your talk, uh, which will also usher in the discussion that will follow uh, the general discussion. Okay. So I can, I hope you can, um, yes, we can now proceed to the response. <clears throat> can uh, anybody, everybody hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity um, by the organizers and for organizing that um, nice um, and, and good discussion about uh, actual habits and actual um, um, yeah, changing habits and changing maybe even how we see our environment. I want to um, make it short but um, I want to say something what I'm I was um, puzzled about because my role is, is somehow defined as a repetent like I have to answer to, to some uh, statements that uh, Professor Nordman did or developed and um, I thought yeah okay um, Wittgenstein himself he had um, he mostly did discussions with his uh, students, uh, scholars, and and colleagues. And um, famous are his uh, his um, seminars in Cambridge. And now we have all the um, a lot of um, writings about the seminars. And you can see, okay, there's a certain uh, um, a certain maybe Alfred Nordmann would call it dance in discussing philosophical problems. Like it's, it's, it's like uh, as some idea and there is a question or an answer to that, you know, and it's like somehow an interaction. But if you, um, and this 
dance with like philosophical dance is is not developed by Wittgenstein, of course. It's uh, it's much older because um, maybe he learned it in Cambridge because um, he uh, took part in discussions like in old uh, um, institutions like the um, Cambridge Apostles or the Moral Science Clubs. And at least, I mean, it's a really old uh, um, university. And the tradition of like... Um, discussing with each other it's it's called disputatio it's it means it's it's the latin uh, um, uh, term and it's it's uh, got developed in the middle ages in the moment where um, aristotle got translated in latin and uh, found his way a long way to um, to german universities and the, the book is called Topica, like how to discuss and uh, there are rules and uh, that get adopted. And then the whole uh, um, school, uh, scholastic tradition of, of disputa disputation and to have an opponent and a repentant and so on. So, so you see the whole tradition is already like, um, like um, developed or used by Aristotle and of course um, his teacher Plato and his teacher um, Socrates. So, so it's, it's somehow in like um, a really old dance we do now and, um, and Wittgenstein uh, did the same. So and, um, and even because I, I, I got not so much material from Alfred uh, Nordmann but but he told he will mainly answer to, to Hans Lukas' idea or uh, Robert Reed's idea of um, uh, like the idea that Wittgenstein is somehow a philosopher of liberation. And of course, uh, um, you would think what could be the, the answer or the, the, the contrary to, to liberation? It would be cut captivity. So you have already like somehow in, in discourse or disputation about um, different parts of um, of one coin, one philosophical coin. I mean, it's, it's like freedom. It's, it's my, could be a good, good um, background for it. Like if it's so, and okay, um, that was a short um, introduction. So, and now I, I thought um, I could um, pose three ideas that I have had in mind. And then, um, <laughs> then you, we can discuss uh, everything. Okay, the first is, of course, our idea that uh, captivity is, um, Is something what is um, is not obvious. So so we learn it now. We we are in a pandemic and we see okay, um, we we feel something changes now. We are trapped in our homes. We do strange uh, choreographies um, in the internet to discuss uh, and and we learn okay. But before we were also somehow lived captive. It's not so. I, I feel the idea of uh, um, Nordman is, is not about um, that we are free now or we are now captive. It's more like a change in the habit of uh, dealing with our existence. And it's, um, it's not like uh, a certain um, change in, in freedom or, or um, so it's not a, a kind of liberation. So, but what um, what changes is somehow um, as there are changes, and and what do we do? So, uh, first, I would say we learn something um, um, about ourselves. You know, um, first we learn like intimate things. You know, ah, I, how does it feel to stay at home? What my habits? how important we are, but we learn also, and, and we did know that, but we, we feel it now much more, how connected we are. I mean, it's, it's really amazing to me to see 
where is the situ you know the old saying it's German I don't know it's, it, it does exist in English but um, somewhere in China uh, um, um, and that crisis is ungefallen, like like something happens, like uh, and it's it's unimportant. But now we see little things in in on the other side of the world, at least from Germany, uh, uh, is is really important um, for the whole world. Also for me personally, I mean that's that's really so. So I feel a, a kind of connection um, to. Um, to the world and to other people and um and and i learn that and that's something new um so i learn um personal things like about my personal limitations and um and how do i learn that it's it's like uh, we have that uh, alfred nordman gave two at least two uh, examples like um the fly bottle of course i mean we are try to to um it's like similar for for our situation does we, we feel trapped and but at the same time have the idea there could be like the freedom outside but maybe it's not the case and um and also similar for uh, he gave also the, the example uh, as i remember correctly about the wall of language and you get pooses so so there are like two 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 um spheres or two rooms and and there's a wall between and um and when we try to cope with that and developing new habits you know um like new dances and And um, okay, one last idea what I had is, is um, maybe not, um, you know, if, if you think about, um, we had that idea, we have two, two um, like positions, like liberation and um, the idea that's possible and Wittgenstein is, is the philosopher of liberating us. And we have the idea to, um, that Wittgenstein is the, philosopher showing us to uh, to deal with captivity to real to 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 realize it and to accept it and to to feel and to inhabit our like a little uh, home offices uh, so we um we could also f uh, um, think about yeah but what wittgenstein how, why we have uh, two wittgensteins i mean we have two positions that's that's easy because we have two um, um, we have Hans Luger and, and Alfred Nordmann, but we have also in Wittgenstein the two positions and you, you can even trace them to certain um, parts of the development of his thinking like um, you could say, I mean the, 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 the quotes of Hans Luger last time was like mostly really early um early quotes um and the quotes of um captivity and um we heard today were mostly later uh, uh, quotes so i would um suggest that there's some kind of development of thinking and uh, the, like some kind of dialectic between the, the, the dialectic between the liberation and captivity is is um, connected through um, a development of thinking. So it's like um, a, a timely development. It's like uh, you have to think of liberation, and when you see, okay, there's some some captivity. So it's like the um, some Geschichtlichkeit, some historicity. In thinking, in Wittgenstein's thinking, so we have different positions, and and there is a certain development of uh, positions and uh, of ideas and of insights, and um, and that connects back um, to the to our um, 
situation with the pandemic. So we, we feel we had some ideas of how we are and how we are connected to our loved ones and colleagues and so on. But now we see everything changed slightly and we learn something new, but we see, okay, it, it doesn't affect the basics of our humanity in a, in a, in a, I, 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 that could be at least um, um, an idea of what you could have. Maybe you think differently and think now uh, uh, our uh, humanity changed a little bit in characteristic. Maybe you could think of a world of a, of, of um, idea of um, um, river beds, you know, that changed slightly. That's also a quote from, from a later Wittgenstein. Okay, I, uh, that's just a few ideas. I um, Thanks for <laughs> giving me uh, the possibility to, to contribute and I'm really interesting, interested in the discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alexander Berg. And um, maybe I would uh, first give a chance to Alfred Norman to uh, respond to the response. And I will. Yes. I will try to be very quick uh, because I'm, uh, I would imagine that there is also a wider uh, range of questions and interests. But uh, let me go backwards through your comments. Thank you very much for them. Uh, uh, I, and some of them are obviously maybe more closely related to how we properly understand Wittgenstein. And of course, as we all know, there are lots of different interpretations, lots of different views. Um, uh, but some of it also takes us right back to this question about uh, uh, what does uh, thinking in this time of crisis amount to? So the, um, the you, uh, so on this question of uh, how how important are these differences between the early and the late Wittgenstein? Uh, as you can tell from my presentation, I don't give too much weight to that. Uh, I, I, on my view, uh, Wittgenstein really never changed his mind about the what you might call the limits of the sable. If by saying you mean uh, uh, making claims about truth and falsity, uh, uh, saying, expressing things in words and so forth. I think he never quite changed his mind that the only thing we can express in words is facts. Uh, but then he also tends, and this is the, the wonderful opening that he gives us in his later philosophy, he tends much more to the other ways in which we express ourselves. I mean, I think these are, he was always aware of that. He was thinking about music and literature, of course, for the whole time, gestures really come into play in a very big way uh, in the 1930s and then shape his later, later thinking and this whole idea of our forms of life and how we express ourselves through the lives we lead, uh, which is something that we cannot somehow, uh, which is sort of beyond uh, the, the, uh, the, the question of saying, of, of, uh, of agreeing in opinion and conviction, uh, but it's a different kind of agreement that we produce uh, when we agree in our form of life, so so uh, so, and uh, and so and that's why I would also think of him as a you might say a very conservative thinker. Um, uh, I mean, there is the nineteenth century is deeply written into his modernism, and uh, and the the conservatism is I think in part really this uh, what I called acquiescence, this way of uh, of settling in to a form of life and the ability to do that. And, uh, and this takes our question, uh, this takes us to the question of freedom and liberation that you asked uh, again. And of, of course, I try to start with that. And I try to say, well, it depends on what you mean by liberation. There might not be any disagreement between me and Hans Luger. We might be totally uh, in agreement. Uh, because, uh, uh, of course, if you mean by liberation, emancipation, setting free, uh, breaking the walls, breaking the, uh, breaking the, uh, the, the rules of domi domi domination, right? Then I would say there is no such philosophy of liberation in Wittgenstein, right? It's not about breaking free. It's uh, breaking out of a set of rules and norms and, uh, and uh, the or overcoming the limits of language. There's no such liberation. But there is this other form of liberation, which is to liberate ourselves in the sense of uh, liberating us from the pain of doing what we cannot do, right? And, and this is how we look at this famous example of the 
fly and the fly bottle. And I didn't dwell on it in part because it is actually the most confusing metaphor. I mean, Wittgenstein talks about imprisonment and, and all the time, they're all images of captivity. Um, but this one actually seems to suggest really there is liberation. We can show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. But I think what is the painful thing about the fly bottle is uh, that there is this fly in there. It's constantly flying up against the glass, right? It's pounding, uh, it's running up against the, the, the walls of its, of its cage, right? And, and one way to, uh, to uh, liberate the fly would be just to habituate it to its conditions. Maybe it could be perfectly happy in the fly bottle if it only started to stop trying to escape, right? Uh, so the experience of powerlessness, and this is where we come to the corona crisis, I think, right now. The experience of powerlessness uh, is liberating or can be liberating in the sense that we just know it's no point in trying to always want to do something or it's no point to exercise our will and to rebel against the conditions, right? Uh, this is a kind of hopeless uh, endeavor. Uh, to give you a personal anecdote, one reason why I like uh, public transportation, why I like to take the train and the plane rather than my car or my bicycle or whatever is precisely because I have no power to get there at a certain time. When there is a delay, I don't sit tense at the wheel of my car trying to make it somehow and beat the deadline and, and be in time. There's no point in that when I'm sitting in a train and it's stuck and it won't move, <laughs> right? I have to just surrender to that and just sort of su the surrender of the will, this, this ability to just let go and let things be as they are is the kind of liberation I think that Wittgenstein might be talking about. And I think you're quite right. I, I like your comments that we learn a lot about ourselves in these conditions, right? Because we tend to those things that we try to escape from <laughs> always, right? Uh, um, as we uh, live our sort of uh, urban uh, cosmopolitan um, uh, lives and as we try to run from one meeting to another and become very important people. Right now we're at home and uh, we, there's no point wanting that and we become aware of the kind of intimate connections that surround us, uh, the kind of uh, habits that really form and shape our, our daily practices. Right? And finally, uh, uh, this is indeed, I think, uh, also a form of, uh, 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 of conversation. Uh, uh, and you started off with this little remark about disputations and uh, I'm, uh, I'm and the way in which uh, Wittgenstein talked to his students in Cambridge and again we find uh, uh, we can find a, uh, a quote that points in that direction even in the Tractatus uh, uh, written at a time where he wasn't really in conversation uh, with, uh, with other people uh, but where he kind of creates a monologue of sorts um, but um, um, but in that, one of the last, uh, 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 last statements uh, uh, of the Tractatus is where he says, the right way of doing philosophy would really be this, okay? It's not the one that he did, in, because you can't do it when you sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper. But it would be this, not to say anything at all, but let other people talk, right? And then just show them that they didn't really say anything, right? Uh, kind of, kind of uh, expose sort of uh, the the futility of the project of philosophy or the futility of the project of religious writing. And as we expose that uh, in a kind of conversational setting, aware of, in some sense, the limits of the sable, not saying anything yourself, just make people make propositions what you might say right and then uh, it sort of uh, uh, gets sort of probed and tested and that that is a kind of form of disputation that is already shaped in a in a kind of it's happening in a uh, under a bell jar if not a fly bottle okay that's uh, some of my comments <laughs>